We're on, on Lech Lecha right, this week, the third Parsha, and we're, we get to know our new friend this week, Abraham, right, Avram. Um, and it begins in a very strange way, this Parsha, as most of them bring, begin strangely. Vayomer Hashem el Avram. Is how God says to Avram, Lech Lecha me Artzecha, you should go out from your land, Umi Meloda Techa, and from your birthplace, Umi Beis Avicha, and from your father's house, El Eretz Asher Areka, to the land which I will show you. So, first thing is, we have to ask, or just as an aside, you see, you notice his name is not Avraham, it's Avram, and that was his name at this point of his life. Later it changes, but at this point it's Avram. And uh, and that means here it means that he's the father of Ram of a uh, father of a nation, he's the father of the Jews. Right later it'll be Avraham, where it means means he's the father of nations, because he had from him came Yishmoel, which was the Arabs. From right from him came Asaph, which is the Christians. There were many many other nations that came from him, but that was after he he, he later on in his life, and we'll talk about when we get there. But at this point, he's still known as Avram, and the first thing that is, God says to him is lech lecha, which you should go. Now, it's the word, the grammar of this statement is off. It's not normal to say lech lecha. If I would tell you to go somewhere, I'd tell you go lech, go. I mean, what is lech lecha? Go you. And so most of the commentaries say this means go to yourself. That is, find out who you are. Yeah, yes, at a simple level, it means to leave. That's what it's saying. You should leave, but it, it, but it's got to be a deeper meaning. And one of the reasons why you have to see that it's a deeper meaning is because where does he tell you to go from? He says from your land, from your birthplace, and from your father's house. Now, tell me if you're going to go somewhere. If you're if you're going some to a place, that's fine. But if you're leaving somewhere, right? You first you leave your house, then you leave your neighborhood, and then you leave your country. You don't leave your country and then your neighborhood, then your house. But that's what it says. Go from your land, from your birthplace, and from your father's house. Right? From your land is your country, your birthplace is your neighborhood or your city, and your father's house is your house. Nobody leaves backwards. You can't leave your country before you leave your house. You have to first leave your house. This is a small country, right? Maybe Vatican City. But this it's not possible. So now you put these two things together. Where lech lecha is grammatically wrong, it's just it's not written in the right normal way, and you see it's backwards the way that they mention these. The God mentions these three places, it is telling you this is not this is not, not just a physical journey. He's not just telling him, right? You have to leave here and begin your trip to go change the world. That's true. He's telling him that, but he's telling him something more by the way it's written, which is you have to now discover yourself. Find out who you are. Lech lecha, go to yourself. Be, find out who you are. And how do you do that? By going from your land, from your birthplace, and from your father's house. What is it? How do you go backwards from your land first? So the point is, we're not talking physically in this case. We're talking on a, on a, on a deeper level. Because what is, a, what is the land? The land is the customs of your people. Right? If we live in, you live in America, they have certain customs. They, weigh thing, they do things a certain way. You ever hear this? In South Africa, this is how we do it. You ever hear people say that? Sure, you hear it all the time. So that's your land. In a land, you do things in a certain way. Then it says, from your birthplace. That means from your city, from your neighborhood, right? Things that are done based on that. So from your from your land is the customs, right? Are you polite people? Are you gruff people? Are they uh, kind people? Are do they only care about themselves? Are they very militant? How are they? That's your birthplace, right? That's the land. Next is your birthplace, which is basically the 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 way that things are specifically where you come from right like our neighborhood here is different than other neighborhoods in Toronto but yet we all have similarities to other neighborhoods in Toronto when and in Canada where is a certain um, you know that lack of militancy here that we don't that for instance the United States has more with guns and so forth where uh, people are, are polite in Canada more so than some other countries and specifically in our neighborhood how, how do people act so you have to now leave your country you know, where did he come from he came from a country of idol worshippers so uh, idol worshippers are cruel people in general 
There are people who pray to a God whose purpose that they pray to him is to let them do what they want to do. Right? In other words, why, if I have a God, right? we have a God, but if I want to decide that I'd like to be able to steal from, let's say, children, so I'm going to go to a God who says it's okay to steal from children. Right? So, so therefore, you have the, the people who are idol worshippers are usually very cruel. They're very self-centered. They become idol worshippers and they follow it because they want to allow something for themselves. They want to be rich, so they make it that they can be rich. And they, they use an idol as a way to do it. So that's leaving your land. Now you have leaving your birthplace is a little bit more intimate. It's how were things where you grew up. And then you have your father's house. Right? How was your father's house? What was it like? Were your parents angry all the time? Was there like, you know, I see that my children are married. The different um, families, which are all nice families, but they do things different. Some of them, they can argue, and, they, and then it just goes away. Because they're not really arguing. They're just talking very passionately. And if you would do that in my house, I would think that you're, you're upset, you're mad. And we would have to then go and sit down and make peace. Right? But in their house, that's how they talk. They're not mad. So, it's, uh, I did, so therefore, you could have one person who would be, who can get very, you know, they could, they could sit and talk and get very passionate about something, and the other person has no idea why they're getting so upset, and they're not upset, because that's the customs from their father's house. It's how it was in their house. Their mother and father acted this way. Their, if their mother and father did everything for the children, then that's how they'll be. If their mother and father you know, did, uh, you know, you know we, we tell a story how when I was a kid, so, you know, you'd go to shul. So you always had people who would come when their kids were, go, like, almost bar mitzvah and bas mitzvah age. They would drive to shul. Uh, they weren't observant. They'd drive to shul. They'd drop their kids off, and they'd go. So you'd say, well, why are you doing that? Well, you know, they'd say, I want my kids to have what I didn't have. I have to work to make a living. But I want my kids to, to have, be able to go to shul. So I, I say to them, well, that, and I say now, now that I look, think back about it, is that, well, you know what happens? Is your, your kids do just what you do. Your kids will grow up, and they'll also go to work, and they'll also drive their kids to shul. They won't become, they themselves won't become that way. They'll learn from my father. My father did everything for me. He gave up for me. My father went to work on Shabbos even, so that I could go to shul. Right? So I'm going to do that for my kids, which means that your father failed. He didn't accomplish his goal because it doesn't work. You don't, your, your children do what you do. They don't do what you tell them to do. They look and they see. Do you get angry easily? Then they'll get angry easily right? as they grow up. So that's the customs of your father. So God is telling Abraham, go away from this land of idol worship. Go away from this place of cruelty and go away from the place of, your, of the ways that your father did things. You have to find yourself. Who are you? But I used to also have this with when I worked on campus. So I would, you know, the beginning of the year, all the kids would come by. And they would come by and meet us. Like we were um, working at, with campus with university kids, and I'd say to them, "So tell me, you want to come for Rosh Hashanah? Sure, I want to come for Rosh Hashanah. So uh, what what type of a Jew are you?" They say, "Well, I'm a Reform Jew. You're a Reform Jew? Yeah. And so, That's nice. Do you know uh, who wrote the Torah?" And they'll say, God. And I'll say, oh, okay, I don't think you're a Reformed Jew. Because Reformed Jews wouldn't answer that way. They would say that it's written differently. Right? They have a different system about what they believe. So I'd say to them, what you're telling me is your parents are Reformed Jews. Right? And which is very nice. And because your parents raised you that way, you say you're a Reformed Jew. But I want to tell you something. Chances are your grandparents weren't practicing Judaism the same way your parents do. Which means that your parents, when they became adults, chose. This is how we want to practice. So you're an adult now. You can also choose how you want to practice. But how are you going to choose? You have no exposure to anything. So why don't you come here, first Shana Yom Kippur, and we'll expose you to something different. And if you think that, no, I, 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 I'm reformed. My parents raised me reformed. And I think it's true. I can't argue with you. But if you come and you try this and you say this is true, so then you do this. That is that they don't have to do exactly what their parents did. And that's what God's saying to Abraham. Be yourself. Make your own decisions. Leave the land. Leave your birthplace. Leave your father's home. You go out and become Abraham.
you become the founder of the Jewish people. You become the person who brings ethical monotheism to the world. And that's a very important point. He didn't just bring monotheism to the world. Most people say that Abraham brought monotheism, the belief in one God, to the world. The fact was that there were people who believed in one God. Right? It doesn't have to necessarily was the God that we believe in. Even some of them might even have believed in the God as we believe in him. But they didn't believe in ethical monotheism, which is that God is prepared to do things for you, but he expects you to do things also. You have responsibilities. You have mitzvahs. You have to do things. You have to act ethically. God expects you to take care of people, take care of the older people, take care of widows, take care of orphans, take care of, uh, of people in need. I expect you to do that. That's ethical monotheism. And that they didn't have then. That was a new thing that Abraham invented. So go find yourself and do this. But what we get from this is it's not at all, um, on a deeper level, talking about simply walking away from this land. You have to walk away from the land to accomplish it. But that's not enough. Because what's here is, is, is God is taking Abraham out of, of the, his hometown and telling him to go to the land which I will show you, which is the land of Israel. And, and that's going to be your homeland. So that's what he says. Then it says, And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. But what does that have to do with anything? God says, go from here, go from your land, go here, and I will make you a great nation, and I will... Uh, make you big, I will bless you and I will make you big and you will be a blessing. And the, the reason that this is put here is because if a person is a is nomadic, they leave where they come from. What happens to them when they leave? They, they're unknown. They go to a new city, nobody knows them, right? Nobody knows who you are. You don't have, uh, you have to make a living, you have to start from the beginning. Like, the, you know, for my children who grew up here to go and to work here, it's much easier for them than it was for me because I came here, I had to meet everybody. I didn't know anyone. My kids want to call someone and do business. They grew up with these people. They grew up with, let's say, the wealthiest guy in Toronto. They grew up with him. So they just pick up their phone and they call him because there's a friend. right? So me, I had to meet everyone. So, yeah, so it's the same thing here. Uh, when you move to a new place, nobody knows you. So God's telling Abraham, I'm going to bless you. How? When you move, like I'm telling you to move, first thing is, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to, a lot of people are going to come from you even though you're a stranger and going to a new land. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great. That is, people will know you, even though you're going to a new place. And you will be a blessing. Now, this idea is you will be a blessing is an important line also, because this is God's saying that Abraham himself is a blessing. Right? Up until now, any blessing that, that came to the world came from God directly. Now God is allowing human beings to have the power to bless. And he's telling Abraham is the first human being who has this power. And he says, he says, um, if it, 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 and he says after that, he says, <laughs> I will bless those that you bless, and, and those who curse you, Aror, I will curse. So God says, whoever you bless, I'll bless. God, of course, has the ultimate top power of blessing, of making goodness in the world. But you, Abraham, if you go to someone mm -hmm. and you bless him, I'll do it. I'll take care of it. And if someone curses you, I'll curse them. Right? So you see, God tells him that he has these special things. Um, <laughs> and all of the, the people of the world, people of the land, will bless with will bless in you. What does that mean? That they'll, go, they'll say to their kids, they'll say, when you grow up, you should be like Abraham. Abraham is a wonderful person. You should be like him. Whereas he is the example to the world of how a person should be. So you, you, uh, your name and you will be a blessing to people. People will all want that they should be like you. That's what God's saying. V'yelech Avraham, and Avraham went, Kasher diber elav Hashem, as God told him. V'yelech ito Lot, and a person named Lot went with him. Who is Lot? Lot is his nephew. So why did Lot go with him? So there's a number of reasons, but one is a medrash that tells us a story. We all have heard the story about how Abraham got thrown into a, a furnace of fire. Right? It says that Abraham had ten tests. God gave him ten tests. One of the tests was that the king, his name was Nimrod, right? it, was, it was not a very good guy. So Nimrod um, wanted Abraham to worship idols. 
And Abraham was going around telling people that you don't worship idols. You should worship only the one God. So Nimrod said, yeah, you're so smart. You come here in front of me and you worship, if you, I want to know, are you going to worship an idol or are you going to worship one God? You worship your one God, I'm throwing you into this furnace of fire. It'll kill you. And if you worship my, the idol, right, which I represent, then that's fine. So he tells them, no, I'm not going to worship an idol. I worship God. And they threw him into this oven. This, like, imagine like a furnace with fire. They threw him inside and closed the door. And it says that God saved him, and he didn't burn up. And he opened it up, and out he walked, like he had been sitting there in a lounge chair drinking a, drinking a martini. Right? So his brother, he, has a, he had a brother, um, and his brother said, they, they, they was with him. And, and so Nimrod says to him, all right, you, who are you with? Are you on Abraham's side, or are you on my side? So he says to himself, if Abraham goes into this fire and he comes out, then I'm on Abraham's side. But if he doesn't come out, I'm not on his side. I'm, I'm going to worship the idol. Right? So Abraham came out. So he tells Nimrod, I'm with Abraham. So he throws him in the fire and he dies. He dies. And the reason that he died was because he didn't have faith in God. He was playing the odds. If Abraham comes out okay, then I'm going to come out okay. If Abraham doesn't, then I won't. Abraham came out okay because Abraham was prepared to die for God. Mm -hmm. He wasn't prepared to die for God. Mm -hmm. So he went, and, mm -hmm. and because of that, he went and uh, went in the fire, and God didn't do a miracle for him, and he died. So he had a son. His son's name was Lot, and it was Abraham's nephew. So Lot went with Abraham. And that's why he went. It says that he went with him. But he also, we understand that he was a close follower of Abraham, and he believed in Abraham, and he believed in what Abraham was doing, so he went with him. And this is where he's introduced to us. He told Lot, So when Abraham left Koron, he was 75 years old. And Abraham took with himself Sarah, his wife, Right now, here her name is Sarai, not Sarah, and that's the same reason Avram's name was changed. Sarai means is a means personal, right? Is she's the princess, my princess. I mean Sarai right? in Hebrew grammar, she's my princess. She, Asar is a prince, and Sarai would be a princess. So she's Abraham's princess, right? But then God later on changed his name to Sarah, which means she's the princess of the world, because Abraham and her had that role. But right now she's still Sarai. And so he took Sarah with him and Lot, ben Achiv, the son of his brother, the Eskal Ruchusham and all of their belongings, Asher Rokshu Esenefes, Asher Asu Becharon. And he took with him all of the souls that they made in Charon. What does that mean? He made souls in Charon. They're not his children, literally, but that's when you describe a child, a child is a soul. You made a soul. You get together, a husband and a wife get together, they make a soul, they make a person. Right? So, but here, this is the people that he was Mekarev, that he brought to believe in, in God. So the souls that he brought to God are called the souls that he made. Right? Why? Because when you, when you educate someone in Torah, you bring someone close to Torah, it's like they're your child. You have a relationship with them. So here we see that, that Abraham right, was such a kind person and such a blessing to the world that people, like they, were, they saw as being charismatic. They drew, were drew to him. And they started to do everything he did. He believed in one God, they believed in one God. They followed him. Right? So he took them with him. Right? And he went to go to the land of Canaan, which we call the land of Israel. And he got to the land of Canaan. Okay? Now, there's, there's, right? and it tells how he went. And if God tells him, I will give this land to your children, this is how we know the land of Israel is our land. It says to your offspring, I'll give this land. And it says, Abraham then went and he made a sacrifice. And it then says that he went north, east, south, and west. He walked all over the entire land. Right? He took a tour of the land. Now, the land of Israel is not that big, but it's big enough that it would take you a long time to walk around the whole land, that every single place. So, so why would he do that? He's 75 years old already. He's got a bunch of people right, with him, and he's got a job to do. What's he doing walking around the land, taking a tour? So the answer is, is that this is actually how he acquired the land. When God said, this is your land, he acquired it in a, in a biblical form of, of, of acquiring. Like, today we do business. How do you do business? You give someone money, they give you your shirt that you bought, 
and a receipt. It's yours, right? That's how you do business, right? What, 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 how about when you buy a piece of land? How do you do business? How do you show that it's your land? You can put a fence up, it's yours. You have a deed that shows it's yours. There are things, right? You live on the land, it's yours. So Abraham knows from biblical times, one of the ways that you can own land is that, is that is you, you say it's my land and you walk all over the land. Nobody stops you, shows you it's your land. So Abraham is acquiring the land by walking all over it. That's why he says he did that. But after he does that, it says that there was a famine in the land. So here's already a problem. God tells him, leave your house, leave your family, your father, right, your family, and come now to this land of Israel. So he goes all the way to the land of Israel, he walks all over the land of Israel, and, and then there's a famine, which means he has to leave. There's a famine, there's no food, right? Whatever crops were growing didn't grow that year. So there's a famine, he has to go to Egypt, it says. So you say, now this is another test from God. God sends him and tells him, you go to the land of Israel, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to make your name great, I'm going to give you lots of children, you're going to become an amazing person. And so he says, okay, and he goes to Israel, and what happens? He has to leave, because there's no food. What kind of a deal is that? You know, imagine I invite you to my house, come spend the weekend with us, we're gonna have a great weekend. And then you come to my house, and there's no, and I'm not home. There's no food. That's what God did. So that was a test that God made. And so he sends Abraham down, asks him down to Egypt. And here is where we have a very interesting story with Sarah, right, with Sarah. Uh, that's what happens. So it says that there's, in verse 10 and 57, it says there's a famine in the land, and Avram went down to Egypt, right? And the Curtis, he was about to enter Egypt, he says to his wife, look, I didn't know that you were so pretty. So, and that's what he says to her. Well, what do you mean? How does he not know his wife's pretty? I mean, he's married to her. You don't think he's ever looked at her? Of course he looked at her. Right? So how does he not know that she's pretty? So it says that, the Medrash explains that, that they, in order to go to Egypt, they had to cross through water. And when they crossed through the water, she had to lift up her, her clothing to walk through the water. Otherwise, she, the clothes would get wet. She couldn't walk. She'd, have to, she'd sink. So she lifted up her clothing. And he saw her in the daylight, you know, not covered. So he realized that she's not only uh, inside beautiful, right, her personality, but she also was physically beautiful. And that's what he says, right? Because it wasn't, it was, uh, physical appearance is important and being uh, and a person is pretty or not pretty or handsome or not handsome is, has, has its worth. But Abraham understood that the worth of his wife was not how pretty she was. So the, he didn't even realize it at first how pretty she was. But now that he realizes that he's got a problem because he's going to Egypt and Egypt has a king. We call him Pharaoh. And he's a king like all these kings, which means that whatever he wants, he'll take. And he sees a pretty woman, he wants her. So that there was a rule. The rule there was a rule in the world then that if a woman is married, you can't take her. But if she's not married, you can take her. But a king, he knows, he's smart. He says, all right, you tell me she's married, so I'll kill her husband, then she won't be married, right? So that's what Abraham was afraid of. They go down to Egypt, they're gonna to wanna to take Sarah. So if I tell her, you can't take her, she's my wife, they'll kill me, then he'll take her. So we're going to tell her, tell him differently. So it says that um, Avram says to her, he says, says, they'll say this is his wife, and they'll kill me, but you'll you will live. So say that you're my sister, that it can go well with me for your sake, and I can live on account of you. In other words, you can save my life. It's going to be no worse for you, right? As it is, if you go down there and you're beautiful, they'll kill me and take you. If you go down there and you're not my wife, they'll take you. Right? Now, the whole thing is pretty strange, right, that he should allow it. But Abraham understood from the blessings that he had from God that she might be taken, but that, that, that ultimately nothing bad would happen to her because God blessed them. Right? He said that you're going to have you're going to have a great name, right? You're going to have many, you're going to have a nation come from you. So he has to have children. How's he going to have children? He doesn't have a wife. So he knew that he was going to have her, right? So. So it says, and Abraham came to Egypt. The Egyptians saw the woman, was very beautiful. When the officials of Pharaoh saw her, they went to Pharaoh and they said how beautiful this woman is. And the Pharaoh took her. And he treated Abraham well for her sake. And he gave him sheep, cattle, donkeys, and so forth, it says. And then we go on the next page. But Hashem afflicted Pharaoh along with his household with plagues because of Sarah. So what did he do? He gave him a sickness that he couldn't, he couldn't sleep with her. He couldn't right be with her because he had he had a sickness like a skin disease, right? So Pharaoh calls Abram and he says to him, "What did you do to me? 
right? Why did you not tell me she's your wife? Uh, what did you say? She's my sister. You told me so you're, she's your sister. You should have told me she's your wife. Now, here's your wife. Take her and get out of here already. Right? And the Pharaoh gave his men orders that they should get him, Abraham, and his wife out of the country as fast as possible. So imagine this. Pharaoh, Abraham is a peaceful guy. He comes into the country to get some food. They steal his wife. Right? Because they steal his wife, Pharaoh realizes he's being punished by God. So he goes to Abraham and says, you, it's your fault. I got punished because of you. Right? This is like anti-Semitism. That shows you how absurd it is. Did Abraham do anything wrong? No. They stole his wife. And God punishes him for stealing his wife. So the, the guy who does it goes to Abraham and says, it's your fault. So I got punished. Right? It's your fault. Right? It's like the Jew. Right? You know, you, you have a, a country where... There's, where they're having trouble making money, it's because the Jew took all the money, right? They have everybody at the. Right? They say one one place you go to, they'll say the Jews are parasites. They don't work. They just take our money. The other one says no, the Jews work. They take all the money, right? But one group will say the Jews control Hollywood and the controls control the bank, and the other group will say that the Jews are parasites. They just sit around doing nothing. They both can't be true. Right, but they'll say it. Why? Because that's how anti-Semitism is. Anti-Semitism here right away with Pharaoh, we see. He goes and he steals this guy's wife, right? And and he gets a he gets a skin disease because he steals her, and he blames Abraham. Right? He says, It's your fault. Abraham, he says, It's your fault that you took her, that that I took her, because you told me she was your sister. And I, and Abraham says, Well, if I told you she's my wife, you would have killed me and then you would have taken her. Right? It wouldn't have been any better for me. So, uh, right, so that shows you that. So then it says that he left from Egypt and he took Lot with him, and now he's got a lot of livestock, silver and gold, right? And he goes traveling. Now, a problem happens here on page 59 between Lot and Abraham. Um, Lot and Abraham are the closest people. I mean, here Lot gave up everything to leave with Abraham. He didn't have to go with him just because his father was dead. Lot was an adult. He could have taken care of himself, but he says, no, I believe in Abraham. I believe in what Abraham's doing. I'm going with him. I'm giving up everything. I'm going with him. And he goes with him, so, and they end up going down to Egypt, and they both Abraham becomes rich and Lot becomes rich. Suddenly, they can't get along anymore. And it says, there was quarreling between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. So Abraham says to Lot, please, let there be no strife between me and you and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are related. Is not all the land before you? Isn't there enough land for your sheep and my sheep? What have we got to fight about? Please, you know what? Get away from me. If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. Let's go the other way. So, all right, all right, so what happens here? Right? And what does he do? He leaves. And he, where does he go? He goes to Sodom, it says. So Lot raises his eyes. He saw the land of the Jordan, that it was watered. And he goes to Sodom and Gomorrah. You don't have to be a, a scholar to know Sodom and Gomorrah. It's like going to Las Vegas, right? He, he goes to a, a, here you have Lot, who gives up everything to be with his moral, ethical, monotheistic uncle, right? Suddenly, they leave Egypt, and he decides he's leaving. You know, he, Abraham and him can't get along, so Abraham tells him he should go. And where does he go? Las Vegas. Right? This is an ethical, moral person who gave up his life in order to be with Abraham and the first thing he does is he goes to Las Vegas. It doesn't make sense. All right, why do we do that? So the commentaries ask, why does he do that? So what changed between before and now? What changed is he became rich. That's what happened. He became rich and money corrupted him. He lost the passion, the hungry passion he had for God because now he's rich. I don't need God. And that's how people are. You know, People will say, They'll pray to God, help me, help me, and then God helps them, and they say, eh, I don't need your help anymore. I'll get a, look at I got what I need. It's like the guy is going to a business meeting, right? So he has, he realizes he's late for the meeting. He's got to get there fast, so he drives. But, you know, parking where in downtown is really hard. But he's got to get to this meeting. So he gets to the where the meeting is, and he's got three minutes till it starts. And he's got to get there on time. And he's driving up into the, to the building, and there's there's no parking. All the parking's taken. He doesn't know what to do. He drives around the block and around the block and around the block, and there's no parking. He's got one minute to get to this meeting, right? and he's got to be there. So he prays to God, God, I need I need your help. You have to get me a parking spot within a minute because i got to get to that meeting. So as he turns around the corner to get to the front of the building, a limousine, which is parked right in front of the building, 
right in front, pulls out, leaving two big spots. So now he can park easily in there, right in front of the building. And he goes in and he parks and he says, God, forget about it. I took care of it myself. Mm -hmm. That's what Lot did. Lot is so interested in being a part of what Avram's doing until suddenly he has money. Now he says, thank you, God, I don't need you. I did it myself. I got my money. So off he goes to Sodom. Right? Sodom, we're going to learn more about it, but it's a terrible place. And it's not because it's like Las Vegas. Las Vegas is like Jerusalem compared to Sodom. In Sodom, they had all kinds of crazy rules. Like they were like a bunch of right-wing Republicans, I think. They, one rule was there was no charity. They said, you can't give charity. Because if you give charity, it costs two things. Number one, it causes you to have more, you need more people who want charity. Right? It brings all the, all the snores from all over the world to come because they want charity. The second thing is if you give charity, people won't work. Make them work. Instead, they're going to be, they're, they're going to come for charity. Right? And uh, like, it's like the, the story with a, you have a story with a rabbi, right? He needed a haircut. So he went to a barber to get his haircut. Right? So, um, he goes to this one that, you know, that he'd heard of. And what had happened is that this, this, this barber cuts the hair for all the religious leaders. So first one day a priest comes and he wants he gets his hair cut and the and the priest says, Well how much it costs? He says, It's free. For the you know, clergy it's free. So the the priest goes and he blesses the man and he goes, he buys him a box of candy and he says, Thank you. The next day a minister comes, or a Protestant minister, and he gets his hair cut and he says, How much is it? And he says, No, it's free. I don't charge clergy. He says, Well it's very nice. He goes out, he buys him a card. Right? He sends him a card in the mail saying thank you. The next day, a rabbi comes and wants to get a haircut. The rabbi gets his haircut and he says, how much does it cost? He says, no, I don't charge. I never charge the clergy. So the next day, right, the, what the rabbi does, the, the rabbi goes. The next day, ten rabbis come. <laughs> right? So right, it's the same idea with, with Lot. Lot lives in Sodom. In Sodom, they used to say that if you give charity, all you're going to do is get all of the schnorrs. They're all going to come. Right, everybody who wants a free free a handout, they're all going to come now because because of that. So um, it was a terrible place to live in Sodom. They said that you weren't allowed to 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 hachnasas orchim. You weren't allowed to have guests in your house because that also brought people who wanted free things. So in order to stop it, they used to make a rule that if somebody came to your house, he had to fit the bed perfectly. If he didn't fit the bed perfectly, he couldn't stay. So they'd say if he comes and he's very short. You had to stretch him. If he was tall, you had to cut his legs off. Right? They would do terrible things, right, these people. So that's where he goes. And it doesn't make sense, but that's why, because he became corrupted. Right, the, we, we next go into a story which we'll discuss without going through all the quotes here. But you have the next story is that there's a, um, there's a war. There's a world war going on now between four kings and five kings. That's what's happening, and and somebody comes and tells Abraham, we have a, you have a problem, because one of the kings kidnapped Lot. Right? Lot was in Sodom, and the king of Sodom was there, and someone came and kidnapped him, from the from Sodom. So Abraham, you better go get get him back. Right? This person who came, he's called the stranger. They don't know who he is. The Medrash says it was a person named Og. And Og was the king of a land called Bashan. He was a giant. And it says that Og came to warn Abraham. And you say, well, that was very nice of him, to warn him that Lot was taken. But it says, really, it wasn't. It wasn't nice. He had an ulterior motive. He knew that if he told Abraham that your nephew was kidnapped, Avram, he would go to war. But he's going to go to war against nine kings. Right? He's going to lose or get killed. And that's what this guy wanted, because he wanted to marry Sarah. And he wanted Sarah. So he, he sends Abraham on a wild goose chase to go get himself killed so that he can marry Sarah. Right? So that's why he came. And there's this whole war. And Abraham does go, and he doesn't get killed. He, they win the war, and they get Lot back. And then it says that the king of Sodom comes to him, and uh, he says to the, Abraham, all right, you won the war. All right, you win a war against a nation, you take over the nation. Right? If I, if um, you know, if the United States goes to war against Cuba and they win, uh, Cuba becomes a part of America. So he's, the king of Sodom here on 65 says, the king of Sodom says to Abraham, "Give me back the people, 
but you can take the possessions for yourself. Right? You know, Abraham, you won the war. The, the booty is yours, right? You get all the treasure. But the people, you got to give me the people back. It's, I mean, it's my country. So Abraham says to him, I lift up my hand to Hashem, God the Most High. If so, if so much as a thread to a shoe strap, or if I shall take from anything from you, right, I won't do. Because right? you're going to say it is I who made Abraham rich. So he says to the king of Sodom, you told me I, I should give the people back, but I can keep all the gold and silver. Forget it. I might take even a shoestring from you because you're a, you're a bum. You're a, low, you're a criminal. Right? You're not a good person. I want nothing to do with you. And you know what will happen if I take from you? You'll say, I made Abraham rich. And you didn't make me rich. God made me rich. So he wouldn't take it. Right? That's, what, that's what he says. We then have... Um, uh, it continues on with uh, Abraham speaking to uh, God again, and he suddenly realizes he's old. He's an old man, right? And he doesn't have any children. So how is it that God's going to make a great nation come from him if he has no children? He's old already. He's in the 70s from the starts. It's already years later, and he has, he has no children. So he says to God, you promised a great nation with countless children are going to come from me. But I have no children. Not only that, we know from the Medrash that Avram had no children. His wife, Sarah, had no womb. She had a birth defect. She was born without a womb. She couldn't have children. So it's logical that they didn't have children because it wasn't possible. So, so, so he says here on 67, he says, Abraham says, my Lord Hashem, what can you give me seeing that I go childless and the steward of my house is the mask and Eliezer? So God says, he says to God, God, you told me I'm going to be the father of a great nation. Well, I have no children. The guy who's going to inherit from me, he's, he's, the name is Eliezer. He's not even, he's not one of our people. He's the mask and that is, he was, he came from Ham. He was from the cursed people of the world. Now, Eliezer was a good person. Right, and, and, and he was a righteous person, but but God told me I was going to be the father, and I have no kids. So Abraham says, see, to me you have given no offspring, and my steward inherits from me. Right, the, the, His slave will take everything. Suddenly the word of God comes to him. That one will not inherit you. Only him that shall come forth from within you shall inherit you. Right, The, the Eliezer is not going to inherit you. Only a child that's really your child will inherit you. And he took him outside and he says, look up into the heavens and count the stars. Right? It says, count the stars if you're able to count them. And he says to him, so shall your offspring be. And he trusted in Hashem and he reckoned to him as righteous. So this is, Abraham says, I don't have any children. Right? And he, God says, don't worry, you're going to have a children. They're going to come from you. Come outside with me, count the stars. Right? Okay, that's how many children you're going to have. Right? Abraham couldn't count the stars, so you're going to have countless children. Right, so, the, the, but, that's not, but that's what we know he means, but, but it's not what he says, though. He says, he take him outside and he says, gaze now towards the heavens and count the stars if you're able. And he says to him, so shall your offspring be. What does that mean, so shall your offspring be? That we understand simply it means that your offspring, right, will be as countless as the stars. Like, you can't count the stars because there's so many, you'll have so many children, right, through the generations. But it says... It doesn't say it that way. So a couple of the commentaries say that when God tells Abraham, go out and count the stars, Abraham goes out and counts the stars. Now, of course, it's impossible. So he says, and your offspring are going to do the same. That is to say that, I, that if God tells you count the stars, you count the stars. And your children are going to be just like you. They're going to believe in me. Just like you believe in me. And if I tell you to do something as absurd as it might sound, you do it your children are going to be the same. Right? That's on a deeper level. On the simple level, that you're going to have countless children. I am the Hashem who took you out of Ur Qasim to give you this land. And now, um, you know, Abraham says to him, My Lord, whereby shall I know that I'm inherited? How do I know I'm going to get it? I have no children. How do I know? So um, it goes on, and he finally... Um, he goes through this long story. He tells him, because Abraham seems to doubt God at this point, he tells him that your children are going to be slaves in Egypt in the future, right? which is a punishment for that. Um, and 
now we're going to have the story about how they have children, beginning on 71. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So here, she had a, a Sarah, didn't, as I said, she didn't have a womb, so she had no children. But she did have an assistant. Right? She had this woman who helped her. Her name was Hagar. She was an Egyptian princess. And she decided, well, if my husband's supposed to have children, maybe it's not that, maybe I'm not supposed to have children, but my husband is supposed to. So I'm going to give him my, my maid. And he'll marry her right, as another wife. They had multiple wives, and this was a concubine. And he'll have a child with her. And that way he'll fulfill what God said. So Sarah, Avram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maidservant. After 10 years of Avram's living in the land of Canaan, he gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. He consorted with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw she had conceived, um, when she saw she had, that she had conceived, her mistress was lowered in her esteem. So here, Hagar is given to Avraham. He marries her, he has relations with her, and she gets pregnant. As soon as she gets pregnant, she goes back to Sarah and says, ha, look at you, I work for you, you're the boss, God made me pregnant. I'm pregnant with your husband's child. You're not pregnant. And uh, well, like, Who's in charge here, really? Who's really in charge? She's telling Sarah, right? She was lowered in her esteem. So Sarah says to Abraham, the outrage against me is due to you. It was I who gave my maidservant into your bosom. And then she saw that she had conceived. I've been lowered in her esteem, that Hashem be to judge between me and you. So God says, your maidservant is in your hand. Do what you think. And so an angel of Hashem found her. So basically what happens is, is uh, Hagar feels that she's being mistreated by Sarah. Because Sarah's mad, right? I mean, she gets pregnant. She makes fun of Sarah. So Sarah gets upset. And Abraham says, whatever you do, it's up to you. So Sarah is not treating her very well. So she runs away. And so she ran to the desert. So God God sends an angel and says to her, go back to Sarah and do what she wants you to do. And if you do that, I will greatly increase your offspring and they will not be counted and they will not be counted for abundance. You, right, you, she tells Yishmoel, uh, the mother of Yishmoel, Hagar, that you're going to have a lot of children. The, nation, the Arab nation comes from her. Right? And an angel says, Behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You will call him Yishmoel, for Hashem has heard your prayer. Yishmoel means Yishma, hear God. God heard. God heard your prayer. And he shall be a wild man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And over all his brothers shall he dwell. Now this is a description of Yishmoel. Yishmoel will be a wild man. That's the first thing. His hand will be in everyone's pocket, and everyone's hand will be in his pocket. And he will, um, and he will be in charge of all of his brothers. That's what it says. This is a description of God telling him of the Arab nation, of what it would be like, and that they would be wild. So what does that mean, a wild man? If you look closely, it doesn't really say wild man. In English, it does. But a wild man would be a man who is like an animal, right? who acts like an animal. But God says para adam. Para adam means an animal who is like a man, not a man who is like an animal. In other words, he is going to be so wild, he's going to be like an animal. What's an animal has no conscience, right? So, so today, now I can't tell you, I'm not a prophet, I can't tell you if it's exactly the same, but today, you know, this idea of having these um, terrorist uh, suicide bombers. When you have these pe these people, these mothers, they go and they let their kids be bombers and to kill themselves, and the mothers uh, allow it. Right? They say, well, you know, they're going to go to Allah and, got, and, and uh, we're going to get Allah, and then they, and and the government gives them money, and the terrorist organizations give them money to do this. Right? They're prepared. I, I always find it hard to believe any civilized person would actually go and tell their children, go blow yourself up. Go ahead. A mother would tell her child to do that. Right? The only way a mother could tell her child to do that is that she has no conscience. How can you do that? Women, women more than men, are known for their mercy, for their compassion, for their love of their children. Right? A woman who gives birth to a, you have to wonder sometimes, a woman gives birth to a baby, the baby is ugly. Right? I mean, they, you know, that comes out, he's all bloody, so wrinkled face, really ugly. And you ask the mother, oh, I love this baby. Well, you love this baby. It doesn't do anything to you. It's just born. Nevertheless, mothers love the babies. And yet you have this group of people who let their children blow themselves up. Right? That's a para-adam. That's what that means. 
like you're 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 a, you're a human, you're an animal, you're wild, right? It's like who would do such a thing? Who would act in such a way? And in fact, you see Hagar herself later on. You see that Sarah sends her away, and and, and it says that um, you know the whole story got that uh, Sarah tells Abraham send her away. Abraham doesn't want to send her away. She's a woman with a baby. Now she gave birth to the baby. Right? How can I send her away? And she'll die. You know, I'm Abraham. I'm kind. Please be a kind person. I, this is a woman. I can't do it. And God tells Abraham, Oh no, you listen to Sarah. She knows better than you. Sarah was a greater prophet than Abraham. She was closer to God than Abraham. And Sarah knew that if they stayed, that the mother and this baby stayed, it would destroy. It would destroy. Um, you know the the, uh, the 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 children of Sarah when she eventually I said you have a chair here if you like so she would destroy them right? so Sarah knew better so God says listen to Sarah so this is a famous a famous thing that God says Sarah knows better than you listen to her so he goes against his will because he's a compassionate person and he has to listen to her and they send they send him out and it says that the mother sees his Hagar the mother of Ishmael is out in the desert. And the baby's sick in the desert. He's going to die. So it says that the it tells us here that the um, the mother takes him out and says that she can't. She sees that he's sick and he's crying. So she puts him like down and at an oasis, like under a tree, and she moves away and sits down under another tree. And an angel comes to her and says, "What are you doing? What's going on? Well, my baby's dying. I can't bear to watch him die." Right? So you tell me, does that sound how you'd act? You have a sick baby, and you and, and let's say the doctors say this baby's going to die. It's going to die. So you just put him down and you say, I can't, I can't handle this, and you leave the room and just let him die. You, you know you, what you do is you handle it. That's what you do. You put the baby in your arms and you hug him until he dies. That's what, there's nothing you can do. But she doesn't. She has no feeling for him. She always feeling for herself. I can't handle this. It's too hard for me. Right? I, I, she doesn't think about him. That's the that that is the trait, right? That we see that you, would allow you to let your child blow themselves up. Right? That's where it's coming from. So then it goes on and it says that right, that here Abraham is 99 years old and God comes to him and he tells him, right, that um, that you're going you're going to have it you're going to have children. Right? And and we're going to have a we're going to have a covenant. You're going to have this child. And so first thing that he does is he tells him he has to become circumcised. Abraham has to be circumcised. And that every one of your children on the eighth day of their life has to be circumcised. So Abraham is 99 years old, and he has to circumcise himself. Uh, but from then on, every child when he's eight days old should be circumcised. And um, at this point, he says to him, that's my arrangement with you, Abraham, for, for who you're going to be. Sarah, uh, Sarah is now going to have her name changed. She's not Sarah, uh, Sari anymore. She's Sarah. She's not just the mother, the princess of a nation. She's a princess of nations. And you are no longer just Avram. You're now Avraham. You are now the father of many nations. And I will bless you, and I will bless her. And when I bless her, she will have a son. And, and this is where you have an, an amazing thing that you probably have to end with it, but it's a very good one. On page 75, it says, um, And Abraham threw, him, threw himself upon his face and laughed, and he thought, Shall a child be born to a hundred-year-old man? And shall Sarah, a 99-year-old woman, give birth? Right? He's like shocked. I'm 100 years old, my wife's 99, we're going to have birth. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God says, Nonetheless, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call his name Isaac. So he says of Isaac, And I'll fulfill my covenant with him. Um, right? And then it says, And I will, I, uh, it says, And I, I will bless him, and you'll have a child, and, and, that, and his name will be Yitzchak. Abraham took Yishmael and all of his servants, right? And he, he circumcised them all. This is where, by the way, the Arabs today circumcise their children at approximately 13. This is where it comes from, because that's how old Yishmael was in this story. Um, and he, he does that. Here, so here now we have a, a, a literal promise. Next week's Parsha, you'll see that God will send three angels, and, uh, and one of those angels will, will actually be the angel whose purpose is to assist in Sarah becoming pregnant from Abraham. And we'll discuss it and to Sarah, how Sarah doesn't believe it's possible. 
and she doesn't have a womb. Right? She doesn't believe it's possible. Abraham also questioned it at first, but he believes him. He believes God. Um, and we and the parsha concludes with Abraham's being circumcised, circumcising himself. Right? You can imagine that for anyone, right? You know, we might think, what a big deal! It's not such a big deal. I mean, circumcised is just a piece of dead skin, right? Well, it's not dead skin first thing, and it's a highly sensitive area of the body, and it's quite painful. So, and now he's 99 years old, and he's doing it to himself. Right? I'll tell you a story that when I was working before for Orsamech down the road, when it existed, we had a guy come from Nicaragua. He came to to Orsamech, and he had not known that he was Jewish. He was raised as a Sandinista. You remember the Nicaraguan War in the 80s? He had the Sandinistas and the Contras. Sandinistas were communists, and the Contras were the Americans back the Contras. And, um, and this guy was born in Nicaragua, and he was born and grew up as a Sandinista, the, the, the communist rebels. That he was, from the time he was old enough to stand up, he was in, in the army. He was raised in the army. So his whole life he was in the army. And he, his, he didn't know his parents. His mother had, had been there and had left. He didn't know them. And he was raised in the army, and he fought as a Sandinista. You can imagine from the time he was four or five years old, he's in the army. He's now 20-something years old. His whole life in the army, he's got to be a tough guy, right? So he, one day he finds out that his mother was Jewish. He didn't know she was Jewish. He finds out she had come from Israel, and she had gotten pregnant. She had a child, and she left him. She left and went back to Israel for whatever reason, and now he finds out he's Jewish. But, he, but he's a Sandinista soldier, and they're anti-Semitic. Now he realizes if, he, if they, they find out that he's Jewish, they're going to kill him. His own comrades are going to kill him. So he, he escapes, and he runs into a Jewish guy from Toronto who smuggles him out of Nicaragua into Canada, and he, now he's in Canada. So this guy from, who's this Jewish guy from Toronto, Toronto who brings him to Canada, I happen to be as an acquaintance of mine, and tells him, you have to go and find out what it means to be Jewish. You almost got killed because you're Jewish. You might as well find out what it means to be Jewish. So he sends him to us for classes. And he comes to classes. He comes to things. One day, we read this parsha. He realizes he's supposed to be circumcised. He's not circumcised. He didn't know he was Jewish. Why would he be circumcised? He's not circumcised. So he comes to us about it. And I said, well, you should be circumcised, really. It's important. Even as an adult, if you haven't been, you should do it. It's a very important thing. It's a big, big, big deal. So he says, all right, I'll do it. So he said, all right, we find out what can he do. We can go to the hospital. And a moil, who's also a doctor, could have rights to practice in the hospital. And they can give him an anesthetic. And they can knock him out and give him a surgery. And this guy says, no, not that for me. I'm a Sandinista soldier. My whole life, I don't need no anesthetic. I don't need no hospital. I'm tough. You just bring the guy here, we'll do it. So they had this guy who did circumcisions for like the Russian Jews. Right, and he would, use, but he would use some like local anesthetic. He he would use like uh, Novocaine or whatever. He said, "No, forget it. I'm a soldier. <laughs> I, I don't need it." So so the guy, okay. So the, uh, we go in our boardroom, close the door. He lays down on the table. The moil comes in, circumcises him, and there's a scream. Right, the guy screams, and he is uh, like they bandage him up, and he doesn't know what to do with himself. He tells me. That was the worst thing in my whole life I ever felt. He said, I'm never doing that again. I said, that's for sure. You're not doing that again. He said, I never in my life felt anything like that. He, he didn't walk. I couldn't walk for a couple of days. I, I don't know what happened to me. I couldn't walk for a year, but he couldn't walk for a couple of days. He was in so much pain. Right? So you imagine here's Abraham, 99 years old. Cir not only is he circumcised, he circumcises himself. Right? And that ends the parsha. We have to know. It's sort of like a cliffhanger. What's going to happen next? Because next week's parsha opens with Avraham sitting at the tent. And the third day after he's circumcised, in pain, right? We had, this is where we get the idea that the Jewish belief that that three days after um, some type of a sickness or operation are the, is the worst day. If you make it through the third day, the third day is the most painful day. You'll get better because next week's parsha opens on the third day of Abraham's after his circumcision and the amount of pain he's in sitting at the edge of his tent. And that be, that's how the it's, he begins the parsha with God visiting Abraham, like you visit the sick. God visits Abraham, who's on the third day, and we'll get a lot of interesting things from there. Okay, I guess we better stop here.